So uh, today was round two of the candidates. Uh, again, only one decisive result. Um, it looked like maybe we were on the way for a fourth draw until Nakamura sort of imploded uh, against Karyakin, but that was fun to see. Uh, anyways, today's matchups were Aronian against um, Anand, who was going into this round with sole possession of the lead. Um, it was Caruana with White against Giri. Um, it was Topalov with White against... Um, or sorry, Svidler with White against Topalov, and finally Karyakin with White against Nakamura. So, um, let's get into the games. So the game between Levon Aronian and um, the tournament leader going into this round, Vishwanathan Anand, um, was drawn fairly rapidly. Um, as far as I can tell, not a whole lot of, of substance occurred in this game, although there was one potentially theoretically important moment. Uh, this position occurred out of a Queen's Gambit declined, um, it's Anand's turn to play after move 13, so it's Black's move. Um, and here Anand deviated from the existing theory. Um, there had been a game before with Gelfand playing white against Grachev, um, where Black played Bishop takes c5. And um, this looks really natural, just recapturing the pawn that white took on the last move. Uh, but it leads to sort of an unpleasant position for Black after knight takes d5, because Black's got to make a choice, and there's no real fully satisfactory choice to make here. There's three ways to recapture this piece. Um, firstly, queen takes d5 is sort of out of the question due to bishop f3 skewering the rook and winning some material. Um, e takes d5 looks natural because you, you're you sort of fixing your pawns. You're covering this previously weak pawn on c4. Um, but long term, the problem is that white can just castle and later play knight f3, rook f d1, and then put a knight on d4. And that's going to be a really strong square for a piece, because black can never challenge it with a pawn, since he uses e-pawn to take on d5, and can never play e5 to challenge for that square anymore. So that's not totally pleasant either. Uh, the remaining choice is knight takes d5, which was played in the game. Um, but this does allow white to capture the pawn on c4, like so. Black does get some compensation for it, like he gets to play bishop b4 check, and white kind of obligated to move his king at this point, because knight d2 it's just going to leave him in an unpleasant pin, and black's going to have more than enough for his pawn. So white's obligated to move his king, and black plays rook c8. Um, and yeah, white's got a bit of... Um, white does have some, some awkwardness in exchange for his extra pawn, but probably it's not entirely sufficient compensation for black. Um, so anyways, going back, um, Anand played a novelty, knight takes c3. Um, and after b takes c3, only then bishop takes c5, and this might be an improvement over um, the previously existing theory, uh, because now there's no longer any knight takes d5, and there's no um, awkward choice he has to make. And also, now there's conveniently a pawn on c3, so this queen can't as easily um, target the c4 pawn. Uh, probably white's still a bit better, but that might be a theoretically relevant uh, thing to keep watch for in the future. Uh, from this Queen's Gambit declined line. So anyways, as far as I can tell, not a whole lot happened throughout the rest of the game. Um, here, Aronian had the chance to play Queen takes c6 and try to prosecute a very, very slight edge in the resulting ending. Uh, but considering he was playing against the current tournament leader, he wanted to keep more pieces on and keep more fight in the position, I guess. Um, but the game was, was quickly petered out anyways. Um... So here white finally had the opportunity to capture on c4, uh, but it doesn't really lead anywhere in this case because black can win the pawn right back after bishop takes e3, uh, exploiting the loose bishop on uh, c4. And if white tries to play a desperado, bishop takes e6, uh, black can actually just play bishop d2, uh, gaining a tempo on the queen, uh, moving his piece out of capture, and he's ready to take this guy next, and he'll be a full piece up. So that would be a mistake. Um, so instead, this rook takes c4. Here, white had the chance to take on a7, but he elected not to, uh, because this is currently a bishops of opposite color sort of quasi-middle game, and bishops of, of opposite color, when there are pieces on the board, can lead to potentially attacks, because if black starts attacking on the light squares, like this, for example, white doesn't have a light square bishop to cover the light squares, and so that could potentially be quite dangerous. Uh, white just decided to play rook b1, um, and... Soon, all of the pieces were traded off the board. Um, so, a pair of rooks went off, and the queens went off, and now we're just in a pure opposite color bishop ending. 
um, in which uh, black's a pawn up, but there's not a whole lot he can do about it. If white just plays a3, bishop d6, and blockades on the light squares, as is well known, this should be an easy, easy draw for white. And so the players did agree to a draw without uh, making each other sit there any longer. Uh, so to recap, yeah, not a ton took place. Knight takes c3 may be something to look out for in the future as a minor theoretical improvement. Um, but beyond that, not a ton uh, not a ton took place in that game. So Spiddler's game against Topalov wasn't very exciting. Uh, they played a theoretical line of the Berlin defense. Uh, White decided to avoid the ending, uh, Spiddler did. Uh, but they ended up in a line that was just as uninteresting. In fact, probably more uninteresting than the ending. Um, but, uh, yeah, they reached this position, which occurred, um, I think, in a game between Carlson and Caruana uh, from the 2015 London Chess Classic. Uh, and so White captured on d5, and Black played bishop b4, which is a novelty. Um, and this might make Black's task of drawing this position slightly easier, because previously they were playing knight takes d5, um, and then after knight takes d5, they had to play c takes d5, um, which leads to this sort of double isolated queen's pawn position, where maybe White can claim that he's a bit better because it's a symmetrical structure, and he's White, and he's got his rook to the e-file first or something. They, Black, in an ideal world, would like to play queen takes d5, and make white be the only one with an icy lighted queen pawn, and then try to target it maybe with rook d8 and bishop f6. But in this case, obviously that doesn't work, because um, this bishop on e7 is just hanging. Uh, so Topalov came up with bishop b4, uh, the idea of which is to remove the bishop from e7 with tempo, um, so that he can play queen takes d5 in that line without having to worry about his bishop being hanging on e7. So that was an interesting move. I'm not sure whether it makes his task easier or harder, but... Uh, it's something different anyways. So this, this sequence happened as is predicted, and the game didn't last much longer, um, because it's it's very difficult to see how either side can make progress in such a simplified position. Um, White's perhaps got a slight pull, but it's probably only a symbolic advantage. I don't know if there's any actual way to, to achieve anything with it. So rook a8 is a simple way of trying to just lob all the rooks off the board and agree to withdraw. Uh, Topalov went b5 instead. Um, Bishop b3, a5. Um, so white played a4, trying to create some weaknesses, but black was actually happy to oblige um, with this. And then he went bishop e6, um, intending, if allowed, to play bishop d5, occupy the square in front of the isolated queen's pawn, cover this guy, block this rook from targeting the guy on a5, and have a really nice bishop. So white took this opportunity to simplify. He took on a5, uh, black got the d4 pawn, white got the c6 pawn, black got the b2 pawn, so the body count is, materials even. All of this queenside structure has been lobbed off the board, and more pieces came off. And this is just completely symmetrical, basically, and there's nothing to play for for either side, really, at this stage. So the game was agreed to a draw. So, uh, Caruana had white against Giri. That game was also a Berlin defense. Um, this time with d3 on move 4. Uh, that game followed yesterday's game between Anand and Tapala for 11 or so moves, um, and then uh, Caruana deviated from the sequence that didn't work out so well for Anand out of the opening. They reached this position, which had been previously played uh, in two games, uh, one of which uh, Caruana actually had the black side of this position, um, and those games had gone A4, um, A5, and then Queen D1. And... Uh, that was played uh, actually in a game with Topalov as white against Caruana, and this that idea of playing queen d1 had originally been tried by Maxime Fashi Lagrave, and this was during the Sinkfield Cup, um, and they had that whole confessional booth thing uh, during that point. And when uh, when MVL saw that uh, Topalov had copied his queen d1 idea, he went into the confessional box and said something along the lines of, "Wow, they're getting really desperate playing against the Berlin that they're copying my shitty ideas." Um, so anyways, uh, Caruana accelerated that idea. He went queen d1 right away. Um, and we've got sort of a French structure on the board, except like every piece is placed differently. But in that structure, one of black's common plans is to break with f6. Uh, so black broke with f6. And white, in an attempt to keep control of the center and keep the f-file closed and so forth, went e6, uh, establishing a pass pawn, but also establishing potentially a weakness. Um... So black tried to target this weakness, 
Um, white went g4, breaking the pin and gaining space. Uh, bishop went back. White played knight h4, trying to hunt down the bishop. Um, or potentially trying to put the knight on f5 someday. Um, bc6, so he's redeveloped this knight. Um, the thing about, it might look like, um... It might look like e6 has forced the knight back to b8 and made black lose a couple tempi. But actually, um, in the games with uh, Tapalov and Caruana, uh, after sorry, after a4, a5, queen d1, black actually voluntarily went knight b8 and knight c6 without white having to, to compel him to do so. So uh, that's perhaps not so much of an achievement for white. So anyways, uh, this happened. Uh, black played bishop c2. Um, and captured on b3, and captured on d4, which black's won a pawn, but this is a bit risky, um, because, uh, well, he's given up this bishop on g6, uh, for this knight, which means that once that's happened, uh, wait, went bishop here, bishop c5, um, yeah, this is a bit risky for black, because he's handed white the initiative by sort of losing time with his bishop. Um, so now this pin is happening, and black's got to go b6, so I traded on c5, incurring some damage to black's structure, and then he went rook a6. And white's got more than enough compensation for his pawns. His pieces are very active, this pass pawn is annoying, black's no longer close to proving that that's a target, it's now very much a strength, it's tying down this knight, and white's pieces are becoming very active, and in fact he's immediately just winning his pawn back, uh, due to the activity. Um... And so, white, white's got some pull here. Uh, he decided to go for some sort of ending, hoping that his pass pawn would uh, would tell in an ending. But actually, black's got a pass pawn of his own, and he should probably be okay. Um, Caruana went, went knight f5. Um, the computer's suggesting maybe knight f3 is a small improvement. Uh, just trying to keep these knights on the board to potentially use this knight as a blockade for this pawn, I suppose. Um, but instead, knight f5 was played. Uh, rook d8, putting the rook behind the pawn. So he's allowing white to grab this pawn, but he's saying that his pawn is going to be stronger um, because there's no clear way to actually blockade this anymore. This e-pawn is scary, but it's being blockaded right now um, by a knight and potentially a rook if this knight leaves the board. But white's got, white's got to maybe drop a rook back or do something like this uh, to stop the pawn. And I think black's now actually on the better end of a draw. Um... I think knight f5 probably was just a mistake. Um, and now, uh, well, both pawns are being fairly well blockaded. Um, and material is even in a rook ending. And yeah, there's no way for either side to really make progress here. Uh, so they did agree to a draw at this point. So basically what's happening is this pawn is being won, this pawn is being won. And once the past pawns are off the board, uh, it's completely equal. Because no side, um, both sides have pawn weaknesses. Um, and they basically balance each other out, and there's not a ton to play for anymore. Right, so as mentioned, there was only one decisive game this round, and that was the game between Karyakin and Nakamura. So after Black's 28th move, they reached this position. It was a fairly normal, isolated queen's pawn position, um, where white had it blockaded fairly well. Um, and he's got the potential for good pressure against this pawn. Um, but for the moment, it's, uh not coming under too severe pressure, and all the pieces are still on the board, so black's got decent chances. White has, white had about a small advantage, I think, at this point, um, but, uh, but not, not anything overly severe. Uh, the main problem is, if black, um, ever wants to, uh, if black ever wants to take twice on d4, so for example, if white plays, well, white played h4 in the game, if black wants to play something like knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, Bishop takes d4, e takes d4. Now both sides have an IQ piece, so he sort of ridded himself of um, of his problem by giving his opponent uh, the same problem. But now the issue is that this knight is going to have the nice c5 square, and that's going to be a really strong piece. Because um, if black decides to capture, he can never kick it out with a pawn, first of all. And if black decides to capture it, white can either put a rook on that square and then take full control over the c-file, um, or he can capture with a pawn and have a protected pass pawn. And then, once that happens, let's say black plays h6, um, knight c5, let's say knight takes c5, uh, which probably isn't very good, but otherwise the knight's annoying there. Um, and white can play, let's say, d takes c5, um, or rook takes c5, 
and he's going to have a lot of pressure on this pawn. And if you compare the two bishops, this is going to be a very good bishop pressuring this pawn, and this bishop's very passive defending it. And white's got probably a clear advantage here. Um, in any case, um, white played h4, which is a very... He's gaining space on the king side, but he's also provoking his opponent. Um, and black was provoked. Um, he decided he didn't want to sit around and get tortured, so he played knight takes g3. Um, which uh, is an interesting idea. Um, so at this point, if you want, you can pause your videos and try to work out whether this idea actually does work, or if it's just, um, if it ultimately doesn't work in the end. Right, so obviously white has to take this. Um, and black's idea is, uh, Nakamura's idea is he's going to take on d4. Um, if white plays e takes d4, then he can go queen e3 check, um, forking the, forking the king and knight. Um, and he's going to win his piece back with um, with interest. Um, and of course, if white plays knight f2, then queen takes c1. Uh, so that that's not okay for white. So white played bishop takes d4, bishop takes c4, e takes c4, queen e3 check. And you might be wondering, well, isn't this the same thing that's happening? Um, actually, no. Um, he's still got the same problems as before, but now he's got to move queen f2. And after queen takes d3, he can play rook c7. And this is, I think, what Nakamura missed at the end of this long uh, tactical sequence, is that now, suddenly, the bishop and mate on f7 are forked. So obviously, if the bishop were to move, um, the mate would be, of course, queen takes f7, king here, and now either queen takes rook mate or queen takes g7 mate. So that's an interesting kind of fork, and um, he's just losing a piece for nothing. Um, so he had to stop the mate, he played f5, and Karyakin took on b7. Um, and the game was over very quickly because uh, White's just a piece up. Um, and finally, the final straw occurred after Rook E2, um, which looks natural, but White went Bishop F1, uh, which now by pinning this Rook is forcing Queens off. Whoops. Which now by pinning this Rook is forcing Queens off the board. Uh, so Black resigned uh, rather than having to play Rook takes F2, and then Bishop takes D3, and now White is a piece up in an ending, and should have no trouble winning. So, uh, Karyakin with the only win of the day, and he now pulls even with Anand um, for the top spot in the Candidates Tournament of 2016. Um, so, that was today's recap. Thank you all for watching. And uh, if you missed the first round week recap, you can go back and, and check that out. I probably will make a playlist out of these. Um, and, yeah.